What's going on everybody? It's Jacob from Martin's Woodworking and in today's video I'm going to show you how I turn an ordinary door into this sliding barn door on part two of the bedroom series build. Let's jump right into the building process. So this is the door I got. I found this door at 84 Lumber in Lincoln in their discount slash special order return section and got an amazing deal on it. It's exactly what I was looking for, a fully frosted glass door for the closet. The only issue was that this door is a regular door with a spot for a door handle and hinges, but that wasn't a big deal and I'll walk you through how I fixed that issue. What I'm doing here is taking some shims and cutting them on the bandsaw to fit the grooves where the door hinges would normally go. Make sure the thickness of the shims is thinner than the thickness of the hinges because we will be adding wood putty later and that's easier to sand than actual wood shims. And you could also just break these shims by using a sharp chisel, but be careful whatever process you choose because these are fairly small pieces to work with. Next, I'm going to attach the shims to the door. You can now see how they fit into the grooves for the door hinges. I'm using my nail gun to attach these, but you could also just use glue and the painter's tape clamp trick to attach them. Here I'm using Plastic Wood X All-Purpose Wood Filler by DAP to fill all the extra spaces and make the shims level with the rest of the door. This is an important step for making these old door hinge grooves disappear. This wood filler is some pretty cool stuff. It goes on pink and when it's dried it will be a tan or pine wood color. It's pretty easy to work with, just takes a little time to get everything transitioning how you want it. I would add more wood filler than you need in this step, overlapping it onto the part of the door that doesn't need any at all. This stuff sands so easy. And if you have any extra, you'll be able to get the transition you want very easily. I just used a small putty knife as you see here to apply the wood filler and I made sure all the gaps were filled. I repeated this process three times for all three door hinges. Now it's time to fill in the spots where the door handle would go. How I'm attacking this process is by creating some circle plugs with a hole saw on my drill. I'm cutting out two plugs to glue together to get the desired thickness I need to fill the door handle gap on my door. Be sure to take a few measurements when deciding on what thickness you need the plugs to be for your specific door. It's better to be thinner than the door because we can always fill the rest up with wood putty to get the desired thickness we need. The hole saw I used was a 2 and 1 8 inch hole saw. When drilling I went halfway through the board and then flipped it over drilling the rest of the way through. This is a good way to avoid blowout when cutting with a hole saw. I glued and clamped the two plugs together and let them dry overnight. I used Loctite all purpose construction adhesive because it's not runny like wood glue. This was very helpful when gluing the plugs into the door handle hole. So the next day I attached the plugs into the door handle hole using the same Loctite adhesive as before and a small piece of paper as a shim so the plug would fit snug. I didn't use anything but the adhesive to attach the plug. Once the adhesive was dry, I got the wood filler back out and began to fill the handle hole flush with the rest of the door, applying enough extra wood filler so that I could feather in the transition between the door and the old door handle hole to make it look like it was never there. And don't forget the spot where the latch would be. I did that the same way as I did the hinges with the shim cut to fit. Once all the wood filler was dry, I brought the door outside for sanding because this stuff makes a dusty mess. And you can see all the spots filled with wood filler. Doesn't look great right now. But after sanding and painting, you won't even know the holes were there. Once you sanded everything, you can always go back and apply more wood filler if you think you need to fill some more imperfections. After I was satisfied with the sanding, I brought the door back inside to clean it off with a wet rag and began preparing for the painting process. The color I used to paint this door is called High Reflective White by Sherman Williams, the same color as the walls in the room already. I ended up applying three coats of paint, two before the install and one after the install as a touch-up coat. And yes, as you can see, I didn't tape off the glass. I knew the paint would come off the door fairly easy when dried and it's frosted glass, so if I scratched it a little, it really wouldn't show up, and honestly, I wasn't too concerned. 
I just used a razor blade to remove 90% of the paint I got on the glass and a wet towel to remove the rest after I did my touch-up coat. I ordered my hardware kit from Amazon and I'll leave a link down below. It was one of the cheapest kits that I could find. The kit is from Smart Standard and it was a heavy duty kit. My door is a regular 36 inch wide and 80 inch tall door. The kit I got was the 6.6 .6 foot kit that works with 36 through 40 inch doors. So as you can see here, we have to get our measurements correct for our hardware. And this kit comes with a installation guide here. So this is the type of hardware I have and that is this hardware right here and it tells us that our holes need to be two inches down and then from the next hole it needs to be three and nine sixteenths inches down so we'll just measure down two inches and then we'll measure five and nine sixteenths so let's see what we get here I know I want the hinge on this side of the glass, so I'm gonna to try to measure it out evenly here. So I just have to do everything once. So we'll measure down the first one, two inches, and then five and nine sixteenths. Make a little dot. See how we line up. And you probably can't see this, but I have a dot here and a dot here. Now that everything is marked out, it's time to drill the holes. I used a 3 8 inch drill bit, and this allowed the bolts to fit very snug. I clamped down the actual rail piece as a guide to help me drill exactly where I needed. I had a backer board underneath the door to prevent blowout when the drill bit went through the other side of the door. Installing the bolts in the hardware is a pretty straightforward process. The order goes bolt, washer, door, hardware, washer, acorn nut. I had to lightly hammer the bolt into the door. This kit comes with two different size bolts for this step. I ended up using the smaller of the two and I used two 5 8 inch wrenches to tighten everything up. Here's a little trick to help figure out the spacing for the rails on the wall. I used a piece of 3 quarter inch plywood and set the door on top. Then I measured out the spot for the rails and I knew I had had this gap on the bottom once everything was installed and the plywood was removed. I had to bring my dad in for some extra hands during the install of the rails. We marked the spots for the bolts and checked for level. Next I drilled some pilot holes for the lag screw using a quarter inch drill bit. Now that we have the holes drilled in the wall, this is how we're going to put the rail onto the wall. Take the lag bolt, put the washer on the lag bolt, lag bolt through the bar and then the spacer on the back with the big part against the wall. This is where this project can be different for everyone's unique situation. When this section was built in the house, we knew a barn door would go here, so there was actually a backer board behind the drywall between all the studs, so I did not have to measure or find my studs. But, before you install this rail, you must locate the studs. The rail comes with holes spaced 16 inches apart, just like most studs should be in a normal home. If your studs don't match up where you want your rails to be to allow you to slide the door open and close, that's when you need to install a backer board. The backer board is the white part behind the rail in this photo. To install the backer board, you must screw the backer board into the studs, and then you can install your rail onto the backer board. Then you will be good to go. Please be aware of any trim, as that may get in your way. I installed one rail first, making sure it was level and the right height before attaching the second. The second rail went on the same as the first. I held the rail up, marking where my holes needed to go, and I drilled a pilot hole. I attached the lag screws with a half inch socket wrench. This kit has the rails connect with a small connection groove that is held together by the bolt that goes into the wall. Be sure to double check for level during this process or your door might never stay closed. Now it's time to hang up the door and see how I did. It seems that everything stayed level when I installed the rail so that is super exciting because I did not want to have a door that would always stay opened or closed. And now all that's left is to install the stoppers on the rail and this project is done. Just slide the stopper onto the rail so the rubber bumpers will hit the hardware and stop the door where you need it to be fully opened and closed. Use the provided Allen wrench and tighten the set screws to lock the stoppers into place. I'm really happy with how this barn door turned out. It gives the closet door a modern look and offers excellent functionality in the space. 
I've been wanting to do a barn door for a long time, and I'm happy that I was able to complete one for under $100. Once again, I'll have the hardware that I used linked below. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you consider subscribing for part 3. Hint, it involves using leftover hardwood flooring. Thanks for watching. See you next time.